In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come together to study um, the theology of the body by St. John Paul II. Please send your Holy Spirit to be with us in our conversation uh, in this discussion, Lord. Help us to grow in our understanding, both in our head and in our heart, to understand what the Pope is saying and also how to apply this to our lives, how to live it, um, and how to share it with others as well. So we dedicate this evening to our Blessed Mother Mary as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint John Paul II, we pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, so we are in Historical Man, the second chapter of Theology of the Body, where Theology of the Body by St. John Paul II is based off of the, the first part of Theology of the Body is based off of this triptych, these three words of Christ. Um, so this triptych of words of Jesus the first word of Jesus is his dialogue with the Pharisees when Jesus refers to the beginning. The second word of Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount when he appeals to the human heart. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who lusts in his heart commits adultery in the heart, who looks at a woman with desire. Um, and then the third word of Christ is his dialogue with the Sadducees when he appeals to the future resurrection. Um, we'll get that to that later. Um, but we're in this historical man. We're looking at man's history. History. We are currently in this period of historical man. It started at the fall and it goes until the end of time um, when we will then enter eschatological man or our future hope and glory. Um, so God willing. And we are on the topic of uh, looking at this threefold concupiscence that is in the world, according to the first letter of St. John in the Bible. Um, we're looking at what comes from the world and what comes from the father as the first letter of John speaks about, we saw that God created all the world good in the beginning, that God created everything and saw that it was good. So this is what comes from the Father. Now, with the entrance of sin, when Adam and Eve broke their first covenant with the Creator, um, sin entered the world and concupiscence entered the world. And so John Paul II is doing a study of this concupiscence and its effects on, on Adam and Eve and on everything in the world. So it, how God had originally planned everything so good, and they had this, experience, this original experience of the communion of persons in their original nakedness, the purity of heart, um, and their living out the spousal meaning of their bodies. They could see it clearly in this original innocence of Adam and Eve. But then the fall came and there was like this darkness that fell over it and they were unable to see the meaning of their bodies and, and the spousal meaning of their body was corrupted. They could not see this anymore. Um, and also their relationship between Adam and Eve uh, suffered greatly after the fall. At the entrance, so when sin entered, so did concupiscence. So we're looking at where does the insatiability of the union come from? Why is this union between man and woman not satisfying? What is going on? The explanation of shame 
should not be sought in the body itself, in the somatic sexuality of both, but it goes back to the deepest transformation suffered by the whole human spirit. So when shame enters the world, they hide their bodies, specifically the parts of their bodies that express their gender, their, their sexuality, their masculinity and femininity. So it could be tempting, oh, they're hiding the body because the body must be bad. However, no, that's not the case. The explanation of shame should not be sought in the body. But it goes back to the, to the deepest transformation suffered by the human spirit. It's a result of their sin. Um, and so the, actually by hiding, they're actually trying to protect their body, the goodness of their body. In relation to this consciousness, shame is a secondary experience. While on the one hand, it reveals the moment of concupiscence, at the same time, it can provide weapons ahead of time against the consequences of the threefold, threefold component of concupiscence. So I, I pulled this quote because of this providing weapons and Bill Donahue commented on this section um, that, that concupiscence or that shame, shame is actually trying to protect, is trying to provide weapons that would protect the human dignity of the person from the consequences of concupiscence. So as concupiscence would lead a person to use another as an object for selfish pleasure, uh, this shame is like providing a protection, a wall, that you, you, that my dignity is is worth more than that. You should not use me as an object. My uh, this personal dignity. The only adequate response to a person is love, says John Paul II. We can understand better the message proper to Genesis three sixteen. That is, we can establish and reconstruct, as it were, what the imbalance consists of. Even better, the special deformation of the original interpersonal relationship of communion to which the sacramental words of Genesis 2 24 refer. So all that this this deformation that happens with concupiscence um, is a deformation of the original interpersonal relationship of communion. So sin sin cannot take anything like God created everything that's good and the only thing the devil can do is twist what is good. He can't, like God created everything out of nothing and called it very good. Um, so sin just distorts what is good. Um, so at the beginning, they had this original interpersonal relationship of communion. And then when concupiscence entered, this just deformed this. And we, we saw last time the verses of Genesis that spoke of the woman desiring the man and he dominating her. This domination is this deformation of their relationship. So before they're in this, this relationship of love that was in equal in dignity, like the man and the woman served each other out of love in their equal human dignity, different in complementarity. Um, but from the moment in which the man dominates her, the communion of persons, which consists in the spiritual unity of the two subjects who gave themselves to each other, is replaced by a different mutual relationship, namely by a relationship of possession of the other as an object for one's own desire. So with this domination, when, the man, when one of them tries to dominate the other, the man or, towards the woman or the woman vice versa, um, it becomes a relationship of possession, which is not this communion of persons. Um, they treat the other as an object of one's own desire. Both the man and the woman have become a human being subject to concupiscence. And for this reason, the lot of both is shame whose deep resonance touches the innermost being of both and makes the female person personality. What? I think I missed something in that quote. It's both the male and the female. Oh, thank you. 
the present touches the innermost being of both the male and the female personality, even though in a different way. Yeah, so <laughs> both the male and the female, this is saying that both the male and the female become a subject to concupiscence. So they both experience this in their innermost being, this concupiscence, but in a different way. So maybe males experience this concupiscence in one way and females experience it in another way. Um, but it's there, yeah. Inadequate analysis of Genesis 3 leads thus to the conclusion that the threefold concupiscence, including that of the body, brings with it a limitation of the spousal meaning of the body itself, the spousal meaning in which man and woman shared in the state of original innocence. So <laughs> sin just distorts all that was good. The spousal meaning um, that was there and that they, they saw and they lived in their original nakedness, nakedness without shame, in the beginning, now it's distorted and there's a limitation of the spousal meaning of the body. The meaning of the body. So now he's gonna talk about what does this mean, meaning of the body is at the same time what shapes the attitude. It is a way of living the body. He says, it doesn't matter necessarily what we think, um, like if we're, if we're aware, if we're self-conscious of that meaning, that objectively the body still has that meaning. Um, so there's a difference between subjective and objective truth. So subjective is the personal awareness, the personal experience of that, but the objective truth is there regardless of if the person is aware or not. Like if it's raining outside, regardless of what I think, it's either raining or it's not raining. Um, so the meaning of the body is at the same time what shapes the attitude is the way of living the body it is the measure of the inner man that is the heart to which Christ appeals in the Sermon on the Mount applies to the human body with regard to its masculinity and femininity and thus with regard to its sexuality. So the meaning of the body is found is the way of living the body and it's in the heart. That meaning does not, here's what I was trying to say a minute ago. That meaning does not modify the reality in itself. That is that which the human body is and does not cease to be in the sexuality that belongs to it independently of our states of our consciousness and our experiences. So the body has that meaning that, that is there independently of our consciousness of that meaning, it's there. And the meaning does not modify the reality. So the reality is there. <laughs> In this vast context, when we speak about concupiscence as a limitation, violation, or complete deformation of the spousal meaning of the body, we go back above all to our earlier analysis regarding the state of original innocence that is man's theological prehistory. Thanks to Adam and Eve, we have been able to find the spousal meaning of the body and to rediscover what it consists of as a measure of the human heart, such that it shapes the original form of the communion of persons. If we succeed in reconstructing what is what this deformation consists of, we will also have the answer to our question, namely what the concupiscence of the flesh consists of and what constitutes its theological and at the same time anthropological specificity. Whew. Wow, he, John Paul II is definitely a genius. But um, anyway, so he's looking at what is the, what is concupiscence of the flesh? What does it consist in? And so he's looking at the very roots of concupiscence as revealed in sacred scripture, as revealed in Genesis chapter three. Um, so he's trying to reconstruct what, what does this look like? What, where does concupiscence come from? 
and what does it mean um, for the theology of the body and this um, adequate anthropology. He's always seeking an anthropology, which is a study of the human person, male and female. He's looking at an adequate one that would include all aspects, um, all that theology reveals about the human person. So next time we will discuss number 32, the threat against the expression of the spirit in the body and loss of the freedom of the gift. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'd like to open it up to um, discussion and, uh, and any insights you might have or any questions from audience number 31 or any other topic. <laughs> Okay, Nick, well, I had a real problem trying to understand the linkage between Genesis 3.16 and Matthew 5.27-28. Because at the end of 4, or at the beginning of 4, the beginning of 4, the Pope says 3.16 points to the man as the one who desires. But at the end of 3, he talks about the woman's desire at times causes the man's desire and of oh, yeah. course in Matthew 27 28 there's only one person doing any desiring and that's the man right it's discussion of the man's lust there's no issue about woman's lust there doesn't appear to be anything but being dominated for the woman in 316 and the woman just left out of Matthew 5 yeah um yeah, that's a good good question. Um, Genesis three sixteen, it, it speaks about the woman desiring the man, right, and that he will dominate you. Um, and Matthew five speaks about the man um, desiring the woman in this way. Jesus, so um, so like in both of those cases, it's it's one for the other. Um, I know John Paul II went earlier a few audiences ago um, in reflecting on Matthew 5 in that passage. He said that it should be taken vice versa, that Jesus gives the example of a man uh, <laughs> desiring a woman wrongly. However, it can also happen vice versa where the woman would desire the man wrongly. Um, but he says Jesus uses that example like he jesus uses the man as an example um in that context and he john paul ii probably had more insights about that than i have um uh maybe maybe you know i've heard it described that men are more visual than women and women are more audio or um like a man, a man would use, this is a stereotype, you know, all this, but in general, you can say like men are more attracted to seeing the physical beauty of a woman and the woman would be more attracted to like the relationship or reading a book, a romantic novel um, or something like that. Uh, so that the temptation would come in a different way um, and the attraction would come maybe in a different way too like uh so i think both of these cases should be taken vice versa is kind of what i'm saying okay another thing i, I read that i found fascinating it actually in in this discussion of 316 said a woman actually wants a strong and dominant man and that's based on evolution that the strength of the line will be based on a strong man copulating with a woman and so you wouldn't go for a weak man or a non-dominating man you want a dominating 
husband so that your children will be strong. Is that, is that true, ladies? Do you, you want a strong man to pass on the, the strength? This is some dominating, a dominating man. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. No, I, thank you. Maybe in a subconscious. I do like that idea, though. I do. Strength. I do. Strength. Yeah, strongly, right? Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of strength, but <laughs> have you ever met thunder and lightning? <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna start a storm. <laughs> yeah, so I have a lot of strength, but I think it's talking about a different type. I don't know. Where where did that come from, Nick? I, I read that in a book by Dennis Prager. He's a Jewish oh, theologian. Oh, right. Dennis Prager. Yeah. Right. Right. To continue the race, to continue. Yeah. In, in other words, we have, if you are a student of evolution, and you oh, believe okay. that when animals mate, they do it for strength of genes, humans, a woman would want a strong man, not a weak man. And that would be totally subconscious. And, and you're right, strength can be defined in strength of character, strength of personality, yeah. strength of intellect, or physical strength. But a woman would look for strength subconsciously so that the children of that union would also be strong. Mm -hmm. Interesting theory. I mean, <laughs> you can argue against it and say, absolutely not. A woman could clearly seek out a husband who was weak, deformed because of love, even though the children would likely not be would not evolution in the evolutionary world would not necessarily be strength of the line. I don't know about that because you get half a man's genes and half a woman's. So who's to say that it wouldn't, the strength wouldn't come from the woman? I, but it also has to do the study you say, Nick. There are also some similar studies in psychology where they prove that a woman needs to admire a man in order for a relationship to work. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be related because a woman usually seeks for support, for security. And maybe it has also to do with, with what you say that in Genesis, it speaks about a woman's desire for a man in a different way than in Matthew, the, the man desiring a woman. I think a woman's desire many times is it's oriented towards this need for security, for support, for protection. And it's also a desire. That's the feeling I get in Genesis. Like, as if yeah. God was saying, you will almost feel dependent on him. And we don't want to feel that way, but... I but uh, <laughs> yes, but, we, but many times we maybe... Uh, subconsciously but we're seeking for this security for this protection and maybe that has also to do with what Nick is explaining right now this primitive way of a woman trying to find a hunter right yeah and, and a hunter who can protect uh, the, the children they're and, raising kids and, and instead of a hunter now you want a man with a good job and a bank account <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's or, so or funny how things have changed, defend. right? <laughs> yes, a man who will be strong and, and defend you and defend your children and, mm -hmm. and that you feel mm -hmm. that, he's, that he will fight for you if somebody tried yeah. to, to harm you, mm -hmm. that he would fight for you. I, I mean, it's maybe something we have in a, in a subconscious level, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe that's, that explains our desire, which is a little bit different than the visual sexual desire that Nick was talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, yeah, the, right. It doesn't mean that we women don't have a visual sexual desire and everything yeah. else, but, but it, we're more inclined to this more intellectual, sentimental, emotional 
relationship, right? Yeah. And we look to those things first. And then the desire for, like, and then the, uh, the looks come, you <laughs> know? Bill Donahue made an interesting comment on the video under that section. Yeah. He's still a make for a good man. Um, and it was right, you know, within that comment. Yeah. And, um, when I read in that section where uh, the experience of such domination shows itself more directly in the woman as the insatiable desire for a different union, um, you know, it, it just kind of made me think of what Nick was saying. Um, with the whole, you know, domination thing. It wasn't really, to me, it wasn't necessarily a, in a sexual way. It was more of the woman <coughs> looking for men for that sort of domination, but not in, you know, in that way, just we're looking for the man as the, in uh, how Delia put it, like the, the hunter, the gatherer, the primitive way, and now we look for the man in the, you know, in that sense of, of the uh, protector mm -hmm. of, you know, of the family. And I don't know if that's a result of the fall or not, you know, it could have been since we're now in, in fallen man. <laughs> so. Like um, Bill Donahue, he also said, that the body has a deep hunger for relationship that will never end, never go, never leave. You know, you are always going to want a relationship. That's what men, it, is that correct? Do you, guys think that I think, I think that's completely right i think um mm -hmm. like that's part of the spousal meaning of the body i think that mm -hmm. we're all we're all made with a a spousal meaning of our bodies which is really the call to communion with others call to relationship with others and even the celibate even priests and religious or single people um you know priests and religious who have who have made a vow to stay that way, uh, to stay single and single people who are maybe waiting or they haven't made a vow, but they're still living it. Um, I think the spousal meaning of the body is always there. And so they're always going to be hungering. You know, it's the meaning of the body, but it also goes on into the interior of the person as well. That desire, that ache for relationship that for, um, yeah, really to be loved and to love, to be known, to be seen, and to see others. There's a line in section three of this audience which talked about that that I liked. It says, the body which is constituted in the unity of the personal subject does not cease to arouse the desires for personal union. And, I, it's, and it's kind of talking about in the realm of sexuality there, but I think it's sort of what we're saying that, I think it's beautiful. I think that the body desires personal union and that because it's not just about the body, but it's like Nick was saying, like to be seen and known and to be united with another person. I got a lot out of three. <laughs> I like wrote a half a page on three on section three so <laughs> yeah so what did you write Sarah well I wrote <laughs> um it's kind of like us always jumping from person to person looking for them to fill that ache and we 
we we find out that we cannot be fulfilled unless I I I'm, I forgot to end this sentence, but I don't remember what I was going to say. Can you guys help me? <laughs> Sarah, does it have to do with what you were explaining now, with what we talked about about two sessions ago about the ins insatiability? Yes. That we that it, if we, if it's disordered, if it's not correctly oriented, then we can jump from one relationship to another. Yeah. Or, or we can become, we can consume material things and, mm -hmm. and never get enough. Maybe, maybe it has yeah, to do. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> that it, reminded, it. it reminded me what you were saying of the other <laughs> day that we were talking about insatiability and it's so true. That's, that's why we're sometimes restless mm -hmm. or we don't know what we want in a certain moment or, or no, or we don't feel fulfilled if we mm -hmm. don't orient all of these desires in the right way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> man, man. Oh my gosh. That just explains that John Paul II, he, everything like he, he says in past episodes or audiences come into play later too. Hmm. Yeah, John Paul II really, um, teaches he he gives this catechesis in such a beautiful way because i've heard it described as a spiral mm -hmm. so um like a spiral goes it'll hit this he'll touch the same point again like he'll teach on the same topic but he's at a new level of that so he touched it here he'll go around the circle he'll bring it back again but now in a new way in a new light so like earlier we saw the spousal meaning of the body as revealed in the beginning, but now he's bringing up spousal meaning of the body again in its deformation in historical man. And then he'll bring up spousal meaning of body a third time in the future resurrection. Um, wow. So he's like touching these same points and he'll do that in other many different ways. You, um, He's just a beautiful writer. Yeah teacher i guess some of it comes from his culture though too They're, they don't think it's linear they think in more of that spiral fashion but you're 100 percent correct about how he uses it is so masterful i found very early in this audience it was extremely powerful that again he kind of went back and he's discussing shame but what he says is don't let shame be a reflection of the body. Shame is, the, is in the spirit. In other words, it's not the body that has been corrupted by the sin of man. It's, man, it's the spirit within man and the relationship with God that's been corrupted. So I think someone's told me that as we continue to go through this, he's focusing on don't blame the body. It's not the body, it is the spirit, it is the mind that we need to work on. That's what I have in the first, on the first section. I have heart of man is where evil comes from. But then I have a question, do we blame the body? And you just answered it. No. Huh. Right? Well, we're, we're, according to St. John Paul, we're not supposed to. But I think in yeah. society, we often see the body being blamed, mm -hmm. which, is, which is like a cop-out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
One thing I really liked about this particular audience is this idea of the measure of the heart. Like, and in section six, um, John Paul II says that even historical man has this measure in his heart. I just think it's really, it's, I mean, I guess it's like conscience, conscience where um, you're, the way I'm envisioning it is that like the heart just can sense when something is not right, when it's, when either it's being used as an object or if it's using someone else as an object, like this measure of the heart um, knows like in some way how the body is meant to be uh, treated. And I mean, I guess the deeper we are in sin, the less in touch we are with that part of our heart. But then when we have a deeper prayer life and we're more attuned to in our relationship with Christ, like even the smallest little things can kind of set off this alarm in our heart of like, I'm crossing this boundary here that's inappropriate and I want to turn back to God. But yeah, I just really like that idea of that the heart has this measure inside of it. I also liked um, in the second section sacramental expression. What does that mean? Can you explain it more? That's a great question. I think this might be, well, no, he, he spoke about primordial sacrament earlier, I think, in audience number 19. But um, this term sacrament, um, he's going to explain in much more detail in the second part of Theology of the Body that, you know, our church has seven sacraments. Um, in the traditional teaching, you know, in the catechism is like, uh, I, I can't even quote it exactly, but it's like a physical sign of the spiritual that affects grace. Is that right? Can someone correct the Baltimore catechism definition? Yeah, is that right? Okay. So a sa that's what a, a sacrament is. And John Paul II explains this broad meaning of sacrament that can be applied bro more broadly than only the seven sacraments of the church. And this, this way of using the term sacrament is what the Second Vatican Council did in documents like uh, Lumen Gentium, when they, when they refers to the sacrament of the church, like the church as a sacrament. Um, and, and so John Paul II will, will speak of sacrament in this broader way. Um, the physical revealing the spiritual and the divine. Um, and he's, John Paul II says, this is what the body does. The body, the human body, um, reveals the spiritual and divine. And not only the human body, but all of creation points to the creator as mm -hmm. Uh, St. Paul says in Romans, like we can know God from his works, from creation. Um, and so therefore, like in some sense, the body is sacramental because the body points to the spiritual and the divine. We say the body expresses the spirit, like um, we express ourselves, our interior through our body. Um, the act, you know, the language of the body, that the body speaks a language through body language, through uh, simple gestures, through all the way through married couples expressing that total gift of self in their body. Um, and this Genesis 2.24, I believe, is that where they become one flesh? Is that, let me... Yeah, so Genesis, therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. Mm -hmm. So he calls that a sacramental expression. Um, so it's a visible pointing to the invisible, hmm. right? Is that kind of how? Yes. Yeah, okay. 
And Thank that'll you. be it. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That'll lead us later on into more of the um, how marriage is a sacrament, and he'll 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 speak specifically how marriage is one of the seven sacraments of the church, and in, and in what way how is marriage a sacrament? Um, yeah. And what you just explained, Nick, also has a lot to do with this part, which I loved, where it, where it says the meaning of the body is a way of living the body. And that's something I always try to explain to the young people studying theology of the body, that it's something that you live every day. It's not, it's not always about sexual relationships, but it's about the way you talk, when you brush your teeth, when you do exercise, when you eat, even the way you eat. I mean, everything, if we understand that it's a way of living, inside our bodies then we know that it applies to everything and i was just watching um, a documentary on netflix it's called maris about a girl who has anorexia and how she starts to develop and to improve her relationship with her own body because she has like she was fragmented no she she did not understand how to live inside her own body so I mean, the path was different. <laughs> she started doing yoga. It has nothing to do with what we're studying now. But if it helped her imagine through theology of the body, how we can understand that we can live inside our own bodies in such a healthy way, knowing that they're sacred. And that's why I give, gave you these very simple examples. No? Brushing your teeth, walking, hugging someone, speaking, mm, kissing everything has this profound meaning right and also it has to do with other thing you mentioned which i also wrote down because i loved it nick that the objective truth is there regardless of the person realizing it or not and this is so important to to be conscious of it because our world has become um it, it's very immersed in this relativity in the way we think relativism right that's the way to say it the relativist, no, it, I mean, it's what, what I make of my body on, or what I make of the other person's body, but it's not, the value is there. It, if I realize it and give it all of its value, it's gonna be good for me, but it's there, it's an objective reality. And I like the way this, this audience explains it. But, I like what you're saying, Delia. I like this idea that it can um, affect many different areas of our lives, not just like the marriage, the marital relationship. Um, because even like, for instance, I am a graduate student, I'm a research assistant, but I've just been appreciating like a lot of the things that my male peers and colleagues can offer, like that I can't. I feel like I can't offer. So even just having a healthy respect for, for what men and women working together in a variety of different ways, you know? Anybody else have any thoughts or questions about about this audience? Oh, Mary, you're muted. Um, just the one thing that struck me so so deeply and it made it so clear, just the idea of dominion. Um, becoming domination. To me, that was just a great, um, great way to remember the, the you know, like <laughs> crossing over from 
original innocence to this state we're in, you know, dominion to domination. Just And we're seeing it, we see it played out constantly. It's, it's so sad. <laughs> so, but it's also, I, you know, it's also a call to, to um, give our lives to Jesus. So. Mary, if I can add, I, I personally don't like hearing, and you hear Catholics and most Christians talk about the fallen world. And I understand what that means, and we've been studying the fall. But when you use that term, it really takes away from all the wonderful things we've talked about in this audience particular and others. I mean, there is still the image of God in each and every person. There is still good in the body even after the fall. So I think by using that term, if we're not careful, it becomes a hopeless way of talking about God's creation and the world as the fallen world, as opposed to a world that, yes, it has evil, it has sin, but there are wonderful things that are that hark back to the age of innocence and that come from the redemption of Jesus Christ when he lived with us here. So just my little soapbox for tonight, be careful how you use and what you say to people who talk about the fallen world. So what what would you what words did I say that would you would say not to use? No, no, I wasn't talking about anything specific. Although you often hear people say, "Oh, I see." You know, oh, this world it's gone to hell in a handbasket. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it it has become a very natural way to talk about God's creation in our world, as opposed to as we see John Paul talk about the image of God in each and every human being to talk about the wonders of creation, to talk about the body, and that that's not where the sin lies. It lies in the relationship between man and God. I, no, no, I, I wasn't, I didn't think oh, you said anything specific. Yeah, yeah, I mean, us. I think it's the whole point of why we're here, right? It's just like, you know, that's, that's the hope that we get from theology of the body. I mean, I, I, um, well, I think, yeah, yeah, I was, um, I was in a Bible study, um, a couple of years ago where we were, um, going through like Genesis and I, and very quickly started going through Genesis and I was like, wait, can we just, can we just go through one, two, and three really slowly, you know? And it was just, it's just so important to linger and, and linger on the goodness of, of all, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about because gotta know it. I think I'd use as an example, if you listen to all of Bill Donahue's, um, discussions about the audiences, most of them, he will go off into something about homosexuals, gay marriage. I mean, he goes off on all this negativism about the fallen world. And, and then all of a sudden we're into a part of the audience that is totally uplifting and positive and the image of God. So, you know, I, I just think it's something that's part of our culture now to focus on all the negative. And if we're not careful, it breeds hopelessness, especially among young folks. You know, if you have time, I was very impressed watching a, a video on YouTube. It's an interview to David Delayden. You know who he is, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, he did all these covered journalist investigation and his, he proved by his investigation how um, the abortion industry was selling baby parts and I'm sure you've heard about him right and there's this interview I'll try to find it to share it with you where he speaks about the people he was interviewing who were these abortionists and they were also selling baby parts and everything and the person who's asking him the questions asks him how could he handle all his emotions 
when he was speaking to these people as if they were his friends and he was hearing these horrible things. And the way he explains how he could see them as brothers and sisters who were also subjects of redemption and that nobody is so bad that cannot be redeemed and, and making this exercise of speaking with them and understanding that they were his brothers and sisters and that Jesus also wanted to redeem them. And speaking in such a way, I was almost shocked because I thought this is a synthesis of Christian life. And I don't know how he managed to do that, but it's, it's a good idea to watch him, uh, to watch that video and to listen to him explain this, how we can see in the other person even in someone who's doing something, I can't think of something more horrible than, you know, procuring these abortions and, and profiting, selling the, the babies. I mean, what else can you do wrong, right? And, and he was looking at them and thinking about how Christ wants to redeem them also. And that they are his brothers and sisters. And then he spoke about the babies in the womb. But every time he speaks about them, he says, our brothers and sisters in the womb. Also, that, that expression also taught me a lot. I was shocked when I saw that interview. If, if you have time. I was, I, was, I was shocked as well that he, he had so much love for the people. He just was so, I was just totally blown away. Yes, we should post that. I think everybody should see that because it's such, it's such a good example to, to win people by love. It's... It is just Christian love all over. It's the power of love. Yeah. Yeah, was it? It was, it was taped not too long ago, maybe two months ago or something. I don't know. I just, I had just had an argument with my brother about abortion. We, we already came to a conclusion that we shouldn't speak about that subject. <laughs> but we had just had an argument. So I sent him some videos. And I was telling him about David Delighton and all the investigation he made. And so I started to watch some videos and I found this one. It's done, you will see, it's like, I don't know if he's in a chapel or what, but there's an image of, of it's not Virgin of Guadalupe, but a, an image of Mary in the background. Uh, I'll, I'll try to find the date of that interview. It's a girl, the one who's interviewing him, but. It's shocking to hear what he said, what he has to say about his, what, what you would perceive as his enemies and how he sees them as his brothers and sisters. And he could be charitable to people he was interviewing that the things that they were telling him were shocking. So it's, I, I, I got a good lesson from hearing that. Awesome. So Let's go ahead and I guess we're about out of time. So we'll, we'll close in prayer and thank you all for being here. Um, would someone like to close us in prayer tonight? Bye. <laughs> She's hiding. <laughs> Amos had a good prayer last time. <laughs> someone else's turn tonight. Okay. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah's turn. You're, you're muted, Sarah. Oh, maybe you want to be muted. <laughs> <laughs> I can say your prayer. Okay, thanks. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this um, time to meet consistently every week to learn more about ourselves and the meaning of the body. Um, and to come to know the fullness of life for which you created us. Please help us to understand these truths and to live it, to live the meaning of the body every day and to be a witness to the world through our actions and through our way of being. And please bless us until the next meeting. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.